we are Teenage History Club from the Ancient House Museum and we are coming to you for a virtual tour today. We'd like to show you around the museum and tell you about one of our biggest projects, which was around exploring LGBTQ plus history. So our group, Teenage History Club, is a group of teenagers aged between 13 and 19 who meet every Friday to work on heritage projects. In 2016, we were working on another project and discovered that homosexuality was illegal until 1967. We were shocked and we wanted to find out more. And this project is particularly important to our group because some of us do identify as queer. And today we're going to take you on a virtual version of our queer history tour of the Ancient House Museum. So we are going to reveal the queer stories behind some of the objects on display in the museum. An object or story can be considered queer if it falls into one of the following categories. The ob object was made or used by someone who identifies as queer. The object depicts something with queer connections or a person who identifies as queer. And the object has significance or has been given significance by the queer community. As you'll have noticed, we have decided to use the word queer. And here are the reasons why we have decided to use it. It is powerful to reclaim a term once used in a derogatory manner and make it a term of pride. It is an inclusive term for all members of the LGBTQ plus community and avoids the need for a long acronym such as LGBTQQIAAP, which would still exclude some. It recognises the fluid nature of sexuality and gender identity. It enables those who are questioning or exploring their sexuality to do so without feeling confined or the need to label themselves prematurely. It is non-binary and it can be applied equally to all genders and it is a unifying term for the whole community. Uh, this is our museum. It was opened in 1924. The building and many of the collections were donated by Prince Frederick Duleep Singh. Prince Frederick was born on the 23rd of January 1868. He was the second son of Maharaja Duleep Singh. He was a keen collector and archeologist during the First World War, Prince Frederick spent time with training units. In France, he worked at a rest camp for artillery horses. In a letter to his friend, Charles Partridge, dated 13th of March, 1916, Prince Frederick writes, fancy you're only having been elected seven years ago. I thought it was much longer. I'm afraid my membership is more like 40 years. The term elected is unclear in this context. The phrase has a similarity to Oscar Wilde's words in the preface of his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Those who find ugly meanings and beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings and beautiful things are the cultivated. For these there is hope. They are the elect to whom beauty, beautiful things mean only beauty. This is an expression of Wilde's aesthetic view of the world. In his novels, the aesthete is often used as a stand-in for, hom for a homosexual man. Oscar Wilde was convicted of gross indecency with men in 1895 and served two, two years hard labour in prison. He was prosecuted after the Marquess of Queensbury, the father of Wilde's lover, Lord Alfred Douglas, left, left him a note address for Oscar Wilde posing Somdomite. Wilde's, tri Wilde's trial and his work were well known, so it is a distinct possibility that Frederick is using the term elect as a code for homosexual experiences. This is the narwhal tusk, the tooth of a male narwhal, which is an Arctic whale. It was once believed to be a unicorn's horn. Unicorns are a symbol of virginity and purity, but they can also be used to represent a bisexual person due to horses often being used to represent women and the horn being a phallic object. Unicorns, because they are so pure and symbolic, are often persecuted. For example, Lord Voldemort drinking a unicorn's blood in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. In the past, queer people have been persecuted too, so that may be why some identify with a unicorn. At first glance, a unicorn might appear to be just like any other horse. It is only when looking closer you see the horn. This may represent the idea of queer people being slightly different or at odds with, with society norms. The unicorn is often depicted under threat of capture, injury or death, which may mirror the queer community's experience of homophobia and persecution. The horn is a phallic symbol, but the unicorn is often linked to the moon, traditionally seen as female. This suggests the unicorn symbolizes freedom from gender norms. Here you can see a rainbow ribbon on this medal. The rainbow is significant to the queer community because of the rainbow pride flag. 
This is probably the most well-known symbol of the queer community. It was created by Gilbert Baker in San Francisco in 1978. The original flag had eight stripes, each color had a meaning. Pink for sexuality, red for life, orange for healing, yellow for sunlight, green for nature, turquoise for magic and art, purple for harmony and violet for the human spirit. By 1979, the pink was removed. Some people think that this was because the community was embarrassed about including sex in a flag. It was actually because they had, had run out of pink cotton. The most common version today only has six colors. Some people think the rainbow flag was inspired by the 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy, played by Judy Garland, sings somewhere over the rainbow, wishing for, for a place with no trouble. Her character is taken away from her black and white town to Oz, which is depicted in Technicolor. In Oz, she becomes friends with characters who do not conform to gender stereotypes. For example, the cowardly lion who calls himself a sissy. The song is seen as an anthem for homosexual men. The phrase friend of Dorothy is used as a code for being gay. This Bible was used in Thetford from 1820 at the Thetford Assizes. The courts held around England and Wales at different times of the year. We know from the records that many people were tried at Thetford for being homosexual. Each one of those people from 1820 onwards would have placed their hand on this Bible. You might be thinking, what? People were tried for loving someone of the same sex? Well, yes. It all began in 1553 with the Buggery Act. The Buggery Act was introduced by King Henry VIII, and it was the country's first civil sodomy law. The Act defined buggery as an unnatural sexual act against the will of God and man. Anyone convicted would be executed, and this act applied to men and women. Then, in 1828, the Offences Against the Person Act was introduced. The new law focused only on male same-sex activity. Homosexual acts between men remained punishable by death. That law was in effect for most of the time this Bible was in use. The law was used to criminalise people who were in love, but it was also used for blackmail and revenge. I will share the story of two of the people who should swore on this Bible. In March 1827, Edward Taylor was charged with assault with sodomistic intention at Thetford Lent Assizes. He was accused by Robert Musket, who had been his servant. The Norfolk Chronicle newspaper reported, the prosecutor detailed the most disgusting particulars of the transaction, but so improbable did they appear, and so void of every circumstance entitling them to credit, that the jury expressed a conviction of the defendant's innocence innocence and without one moment's further consideration acquitted him. Was this a case of a dismissed servant using accusations of sodomy as revenge or had the master taken advantage of his servant? The second story is known as the Taylor of Dicks, a love triangle that ended in murder. For about 20 years in the early 18th century, Robert Carlton, a tailor in Dicks, Norfolk, lived with John Lincoln, who lay with him and was kept by him. Their homosexual relationship does not seem to have caused comment until, in 1741, Lincoln made courtship to Mary Frost from Redgrave in Suffolk. Carlton was jealous of their relationship. In November 1741, he invited Lincoln and Mary Frost to eat with him. He mixed poison with salt and told her to eat heartily, which she did. She died two days later. Robert Carlton was tried at Thetford Assizes for murder and sodomy. The law did not make a distinction between the two, as both were capital offences, crimes for which he could be hanged. Carlton and Lincoln's 20-year homosexual relationship was clearly well known in the town. Francis Bloomfield, historian, wrote Carlton was notoriously guilty of that abominable sin, sodomy, indicating that people in Dis were aware of Carlton and Lincoln's homosexual relationship. However, there is no record of complaints about this before the murder, suggesting people were happy to ignore the same-sex love. But when murder occurred, the sodomy was used to intensify Carlton's guilt. John Lincoln was able to escape prosecution by giving evidence against his former lover. It seems to be considered that he was led astray by Carlton and that he was a victim rather than a willing participant. He went on to marry a woman in October of 1742. In March 1742, Robert Carlton was sentenced to death for sodomy upon John Lincoln and also for murder through poisoning of Mary Frost. Before his execution, he sent for Lincoln. They drank two pints of ale together, and Carlton was said to have given to Lincoln his shears, scissors, and a thimble 
together with two sixpences. Carlton told Lincoln that though he died for him, he loved him till the last. The two parted friends. Here you can see replicas of the famous Deptford treasure, a late Roman hoard of gold and silver found metal detector in 1979. These spoons have in inscriptions of Faunus, who is a Roman patient of Pan, the butcher, and his many relationships, like those who identify as pansexual, including Daphnis, the son of Hermes, and a nymph, who he, who he taught. Mermaids are significant to the queer community in several ways. You probably know the story of the Little Mermaid, maybe from the Disney film? The original story was written in 1837 by Hans Christian Andersen. In the original story, Ariel, the Little Mermaid, tries to move from the sea to live on the land. The transition is painful and she has to give up her voice to make the move. When she walks on land with knives, this can be seen as an analogy for a queer person trying to fit into a straight world. In the end, Ariel is rejected by her human love in favour of a so-called normal woman. Many people think Anderson was inspired by falling in love with a man who did not return his love. The music for the Disney version of The Little Mermaid was mostly written by Howard Ashman, a gay man. Much of his music and the music for the film can be seen as queer analogies, particularly the song Part of Your World. During the making of the film, Ashman was diagnosed with HIV AIDS and he died two years later. He never got to see the premiere or the success of his last film, Beauty and the Beast. But at the end, a dedication reads, to our friend Howard, who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul, we will be forever grateful. Mermaids have no genitals. They can be seen as gender non-binary. There is now a group called Mermaids who support children and young people up to 20 years old who are transgender diverse and their families and professionals involved in their care. Butterflies. A butterfly starts its life in one stage, cocoons itself and while in that cocoon transforms into the beautiful insect that breaks out of it and becomes the winged creature you see fluttering around. In a sense the transitions of trans people are, are analogous. They start their lives in their birth gender presentation and body configuration, go through the transition and then exit the other side of their transitions as the beautiful people they always were with the gender identification and body finally matching for them to happily live their lives. Many times you will see those butterflies in the trans community publications being pink, blue or purple with pink being the color that symbolizes femininity and blue for masculinity and purple being a blending of the two. This is a Bugs Bunny Christmas decoration showing Bugs dressed as Carmen Miranda from Yankee Doodle Daffy. Bugs often wears women's clothes as a disguise to escape Elmer Fudd. However, the detail of the costume is often more ex excessive than required. Did you know that Jamie John, the UK's only dwarf act, was born in Norfolk? He performs as Miss DQ. You might have also seen him in Harry Potter and the Daffy Hallows. He says that there is an art to being a drag queen. For me, pride, pride is about bringing the community together. It's everyone. There are no labels. That's why it's so important. My friends and family were really supportive of, of drag. They loved it. There is always that thing about coming out. As a gay man, you're going to get homophobia, but put on a dress and it's different. Anyone could put on a dress in mine, but it doesn't make them a drag queen. This program shows Justin Fashnu. Fashnu was brought in London on the 19th of February 1962. After his parents split up, Justin and his brother, John, 
were adopted by Betty and Alf Jackson in Shropham, Norfolk. John Vashney remembers they were the only black people in the village. Vashney became a professional player for Norwich City in 1978. He scored over 40 goals for Norwich City, including the BBC goal of the season in 1980 against Liverpool. In 1981, he became Britain's first million pound black footballer when he transferred to Nottingham Forest. In 1990, in 1990 Vashney came out as gay in the Sun newspaper. He was the first and only prominent player in English football to do so. Justin, Justin Fashnu moved to America and became a coach. In March 1998, a 17-year-old boy ac accused Fashnu of sexual assault. Homosexual acts were illegal in the American state of Maryland at the time. Fashnu was questioned by police but not held in custody. Immediately after his release, Fashnu moved back to England. On the 2nd of May 1998, Fashnu killed himself. In his suicide note, he said, Being gay and a personality is so hard. I want to say I didn't sexually assault the young boy. He willingly had sex with me and then the next day asked for money. When I said no, he said, you wait and see. If that is the case, I hear you say, why did I run? Well, justice isn't always fair. I felt I wouldn't get a fair trial because of my homosexuality. In 2008, inspired by his story, the Justin campaign was set up in Norwich to, co to combat homophobia, transphobia and biphobia in football. This is a Thetford pulp where cake stand. Cake has become a symbol for the bisexual community as a reclaiming of the accusation, have your cake and eat it. It is a symbol for the asexual community from the idea that an ace person would rather eat cake than have sex. This is a long case clock made by Jay Spendlove with a silver figure of time, which rocks with the middle. You can see pictures of George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte. At the base is a picture of William Pitt with some of his colleagues. William Pitt the Younger was fluent in Latin by the age of seven and the youngest prime minister in Britain when he was 24. We think Pitt the Younger might have been queer. He was rumoured to prefer the company of men. In public, Pitt often appeared cold and stiff. He said, I am the shyest man alive. But his close friends, such as William Wilberforce, described him as being systematically witty and something between God and man. From late 1784, a series of satirical verses appeared in the Morning Herald, drawing attention to Pitt's lack of knowledge of women. Tis true, indeed, we oft abuse him because he bends to no man but slander's self does not accuse him of stiffness to a woman. This poem suggests Pitt does not get a, an erection when looking at women. Maybe this also means he was gay. He certainly had close friendships with men. The playwright Sheridan compared Pitt and Tom Steele, the Secretary of the Treasury, to James I's lover, the Duke of Buckingham. Later, he had a similar relationship with George Canning, a politician. Canning was seen to touch him on the shoulder in an intimate manner. Pitt behaved in a strange, trance-like way at Canning's wedding in 1800, and in 1804, Pitt's niece, Lady Hester Stan Stanhope, told Canning that Pitt is attached to you in a way unlike he what he feels about anybody else. However, Pitt does not seem to have sexual relationships with these men. We think he might have been asexual, but with homoromantic feelings. Roses are symbolically associated with lesbian love. It was used as a code between lesbians and bisexual women when homosexuality was illegal. Roses are linked to the Roman poet Sappho, born on the island of Lesbos around 630 to 570 BC. Sappho's sexuality has always been debated, with it coming to be known as the Great Sappho Question. With 97% of Sappho's work having not survived, her sexuality can only be inferred from the small fragments and few remaining complete works that have survived. The fragment, you may blame Aphrodite, soft as she is, has almost killed me with love of that boy, suggests that she was heterosexual. However, her poem, Ode to Aphrodite, one of her few surviving complete poems, suggests otherwise. The speaker, who is identified as Sappho, seeks help from Aphrodite in pursuit of the affections of an unnamed woman. This ancient Greek word establishes Sappho's love as female. This is one of the few works that gives clues to Sappho having loved other women. 
In one poem, she describes a lost love wearing a garland of violet tiaras, braided rosebuds, dill and crocus tied around her neck. In another fragment, she recalls her lover as having put around yourself many wreaths of violets and roses. Whatever Sappho's sexuality may have been, today she's an accepted symbol of female homosexuality, with the term lesbian being derived from Sappho's place of birth, the island of Lesbos. This is a painting of Blow Norton Hall, which is linked to Virginia Woolf, who was bisexual. In August 1906, Virginia Stephen came to stay at Blow Norton Hall near Thetford. Virginia would go on to marry Leonard Woolf in 1912 and form part of the Bloomsbury set of English writers and artists. Many of the Bloomsbury set identified as queer. Virginia recorded in her diary the journey from Dis Railway Station to Blow Norton Hall. She said, the very light seems to filter through deep layers and the air circulates slowly, as though it had but to make the circuit of the hall and its duties were complete. Virginia explored the area and rode her bicycle to Thetford. In a letter to her friend Violet Dickinson, she said, I tramped the country for miles with a map, making out br beautiful, brilliant stories every step of the way. One is actually being, as we geniuses say, transferred to paper at this moment. The story would become the journal of Miss Joan Martin, Rosamond Meridue, the main character is a historian researching England's land tenure system. The story includes Virginia's views about the role of women as historians and also reflects her view of the significance of women in English history. Virginia would develop these themes in her novel Orlando in 1928. Orlando spans 400 years and tells the story of an aristocrat who travels the world having sex with both men and women. Virginia based Orlando on her lover, Beta Sackville West. The novel has lesbian and bisexual elements and explores gender and sexual identity. Virginia met Vita in 1922 and recorded in her diary that Vita was a pronounced sapphist, a reference to Sappho, the Roman poet who lived on the island of Lesbos. The couple had a passionate affair. They were both married and we would probably call them bisexual today. In 1926, Vita wrote, I am reduced to a thing that wants Virginia. Virginia responded, I have missed you. I do miss you. I shall miss you. And if you don't believe it, you're a long eared owl and ass. Even after their affair ended, they continued to write to each other. And there was even a letter from Virginia to Vita dated just six days before Virginia killed herself in 1941. This is a photo of Princess Catherine. She was the one of the daughters of Maharaja Dulip Singh, the last Maharaja of the Punjab. Catherine was born on 27th of October, 1871, and was the second daughter of Mah Maharaja Dulip Singh. She grew up at Elverdon Hall near Thetford. She was considered to be the most attractive of the three Dulip Singh princesses, but she never married. Catherine fell in love with her governess, Fraulein Lena Sharper from Germany. In 1908, Lena and Catherine moved to Germany and set up a house together. Lena said, we are like two mice living in a little house. The couple enjoyed taking long walks. Catherine liked gardening and Lena liked to cook. Catherine wrote, I'm having a very good time of it and enjoying myself thoroughly. In November 1938, after Lena's death, Catherine sold everything and returned to England. Before she left, she was able to help two Jewish families escape the Nazis.